Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's video. It's a new year, I think anyway, but you know what? Raycon is still here to keep your ears moving with products like their everyday earbuds that look, feel, and sound better than ever. And with their optimized gel tips giving you the perfect, comfortable fit for your ears, they ain't falling off your ears anytime soon. With over eight hours of playtime and 32 hour total battery life thanks to the rechargeable carrying case, not to mention they're about half the price of other premium audio brands, it's no wonder why the everyday earbuds have over 48,000 five-star reviews and why they're my go-to choice for workout and yoga sessions. It's gonna suck when they get stained in sweat though. And Raycon is offering all my viewers a great deal. Click the link in the description below or go to buyraycon.com slash some call me Johnny to save 15% off your next Raycon purchase. Here's to a strong 2022 and thanks for supporting my channel and making this all possible. You guys rock for that. Now let's continue on with the show. All right, I have returned to the realm of Final Fantasy, continuing my adventure through the Super Nintendo era. But uh, over the last year, the landscape for the, the series, the classic series at least, sort of changed, hasn't it? Since my last video, my review of Mystic Quests, Square went and released these Pixel remasters. Though the sixth one hasn't been released yet at the time of this video uploading, fans and newbies alike have a new way of experiencing the classics, and with some will use that term loosely. New pixel art, detailed backgrounds, absolute killer soundtrack arrangements that I'd argue is worth the purchase alone. And in Final Fantasy III's case, removing job points so you can switch as often as you want, balancing jobs all together to make some more useful, making the Crystal Tower section less bullshit, giving it healing points to keep yourself alive. I mean, it's still a pain in the ass overall, but the Cloud of Darkness doesn't just incessantly spam the same goddamn attack repeatedly. But here it is, I'd argue, the definitive Final Fantasy III. Get the Pixel Remaster now, booze optional. The earlier games given new life and released on platforms that make them more accessible than they've ever been is appreciated. They're just not released on every platform that matters yet. But Pixel remasters, as of now, are only available on PC and mobile phones, with fans clamoring for a console release like a magic pot wooden elixir. And it's like, we all know what Square is doing here, right? There is no chance in hell they weren't aware of the console base when they were releasing these games on PC and mobile first. So what they're gonna do is that they're gonna wait until the sixth game and then a couple of months later, a year, give or take, they're gonna claim that they're listening to the fans and then finally release them for consoles when most fans have likely already bought the game on PC or mobile because FOMO is a bitch and they want all that double dipping cash, you weak-minded fools. I personally would not even consider the idea for one reason and one reason only, this basic ass free trial font shit they got going on here, what is this English font? And it's such a simple fix too, PC players can change the font to their liking just by replacing a measly two files in the game's dedicated folder. It's not perfect depending on the font, it can cause some text wrapping issues. I use the Mystic Quest font for this playthrough because I think for Final Fantasy V, it fits damn well. But as you can see, there's a bit of clipping here in the job menu, but the rest of the game is still more than legible. So what the hell? I hope it's something they fixed for the eventual console release. And the PC version too, it's still like that on the PC version even today, so I don't know, maybe it's just what they wanted to do. Maybe it has something to do with the mobile game market, they had to make sure certain assets were shared between certain... It's ugly. <laughs> That said, for today's video, yeah, I will be playing the newly released Pixel Remaster for Final Fantasy V because, well, I think textual jank aside, this is a legitimately great version of the game that easily outdoes the original mobile and PC release. I mean, the backgrounds are fine, and my god, the enemy sprites were so detailed. I am convinced Final Fantasy V was next up to get the PSP treatment like Final Fantasy 1, 2, and 4 did, but that never happened, obviously, and what we ended up originally getting was a sort of hodgepodge of a PSP version, and whatever the hell these character sprites were. They have the posture of mannequins, and ugh, the god-awful user interface. So lifeless. I hate looking at this. The Pixel Remaster is much easier on the eyes, though I do miss the updated monster sprites. And I wanted to use this video as an excuse just to quickly talk about my opinion on the Pixel Remasters overall. I won't take too long with this, I promise. Firstly, it's cool that international players now have an official version of the Famicom Final Fantasy 3. You don't need the DS remake anymore. Download an English translated ROM. Here's the old Famicom release with a shiny coat of paint. That took, what, fucking 30 something years? Good lord. Well, I guess I think it would have been better if they just re-released like, the PlayStation Portable versions of Final Fantasy 1 and 2, since I still think those are the best versions of the game even today. I won't lie and say that these Pixel Remasters don't have their own charm and style and presentation, and they still carry over some quality of life updates introduced in earlier revisions. Like an auto battle function, hit a button, the game speeds up, and your characters go on autopilot performing the last move you used. Great for grinding encounters when you're close to a town. You have an auto run button letting your characters sprint their asses off and uh, run into random encounters more frequently. Practice caution with that. 
You can also move diagonally now, that was a little weird to experience, but that does mean you could potentially optimize your route and not risk taking more steps than necessary and initiate more battles, it's a neat bonus. As is the autosave, the game will make a checkpoint of your last entered room, so say if you died in a dungeon, you don't necessarily have to start at your last save point, you can just load up the checkpoint and save yourself some backtracking. Every remaster has a new map system that's a godsend for the earlier games, especially for 2 and its long winded dungeon nonsense. For others, given the better dungeon design, it does remove a bit of the exploration element. You hit a button and there you go, the entire layout of the room is just shown to you, treasure and all. But for me, it's really no different than looking up a strategy guide, it's just there to save you time. And again, the remastered music is just mwah. It's like they took the best bits of Octopath Traveler and gave Final Fantasy the same love. I don't have much in real problems, they're pretty small gripes all things considered. And let's start with the smallest of gripes. I don't like how the text boxes just instantly pop in, sometimes it feels like I'm playing a cheap flash based version of Final Fantasy. Remember Flash? The color palette seems to be based on the GBA or at least the Wonderswan releases, so on PC the whole picture can look washed out. It's why for this Final Fantasy V review, I installed a gamma correction mod to restore the color to the Super Nintendo version, and now things are looking a little better. And I can already hear you diehard Dark Souls fans all you'll install a mod for Final Fantasy, but you won't install the PC fix for Dark Souls? Yeah. I still enjoyed the game, didn't I? Isn't that what matters? The new presentation is great, however, all the pixel remasters now share the same spell and effect animations. And they're good, they are, but this sort of homogenizes the entire product. All of these games now have the same fire and blizzard animations, the same haste animation, sort of removes some unique aspects found in each respective game. And I know for the NES games, this isn't that big of a deal. It ain't that hard to improve on games that were limited by the technology of their time. I don't know, I miss some of the original Final Fantasy IV spell animations, some of Final Fantasy V's animations. But again, the new stuff is still pretty good, so it's nothing to lose sleep over. And man, a lot of these spells sure do use the same sound effects from Final Fantasy VI, so it's like, gee, I wonder what game is gonna get all the love for its eventual pixel remaster. Do you think Square nowadays likes Final Fantasy VI more than the other classics? I don't know, it's kinda hard to tell. Well, we'll get there eventually. Today is all about the fifth game in the series, the second Super Nintendo entry, the one that we here in the United States didn't see a release for initially. Critical reception of the previous Final Fantasy IV was promising, but with the RPG market still being as niche as it was in the early 90s over in the West, sales were not that stellar. Fearing that the next Final Fantasy's return to the job system would be deemed too complicated for newcomers, Square nixed their initial plans on localizing it and gave international players Mystic Quest instead, which did nothing to alleviate matters. A lot of people thought Mystic Quest was too brain dead and a step down from Final Fantasy IV, so whoops. Square wouldn't tempt fate again and just give us Final Fantasy VI as release, but Final Fantasy V wouldn't finally see an American release until Final Fantasy Anthology, the 1999 compilation of Final Fantasy V and Final Fantasy VI on the PlayStation 1, which is no doubt thanks to the newfound popularity Square was experiencing after releasing Final Fantasy VII for the system in 1997. I was excited for this anthology, Final Fantasy V, that's one of the Final Fantasies I never played, and by this time I was a certified fan of the series, so I did put several hours of game time on this collection. But more on Final Fantasy VI than Final Fantasy V, but part of that was because I was already familiar with VI and I loved playing it on the Super Nintendo. So I figured, okay, I'll just do that again on the PlayStation. Another part was because, holy fuck, I thought Final Fantasy V was so hard back that fuck Square was right, I'm an idiot. But no, it was that, but the music also sounded weird, something got lost in the shuffle here. The added load times for battles and menu navigation made the whole journey much slower than its SNES original. And even as a 12 year old playing this, this localization was making me wheeze. Ferris had this obnoxious pirate accent throughout the whole game, and okay, sure, she was raised by pirates, but good god, it was so annoying to read. It doesn't even sound like words coming out of her mouth, it just sounds like she's coughing off fur balls. What the hell is to- I'll give the anthology version one thing though, it gave me my favorite mistranslated enemy in the series. This dude in the Walls Tower is supposed to be a wyvern, but in anthology, wyvern. You know what, I can't even be mad at that, it is a feat how it missed the mark so hard that it wrapped back to being impressive. It's on the same level to me as Hot Wings from Mystic Quest. Later in the mid 2000s, Final Fantasy V would get the advanced treatment for the Game Boy Advance. And it's this version I actually beat when I got it the first time, I never finished the game on Anthology. And later on when I emulated it on like the ZSNES during high school, I used cheat code so I can use Guild Toss and everything, I'll explain that later. But you can make the argument that Advance is still the best version of the game to date. Yeah, even with the pixel remaster in mind. The screen resolution is a little squished, the colors are a bit washed, and the sound took a hit because of the hardware, yeah, but it got a new localization still being used in other re-releases to this day, so no more Ferris. <laughs> The gameplay was still as solid as the original, there were no PlayStation 1 load times, and there was not that much of a selling point in my opinion. It had some extra content, like a couple of new jobs that I think you couldn't unlock until post-game, so that kind of makes it moot. 
There was also a new dungeon added with new challenges, things to give you more playtime. Pretty innocuous shit altogether, I can take it or leave it. But if you're thinking of playing Final Fantasy V after this video and you don't want to buy the Pixel Remaster, fuck it, try and get a copy of Final Fantasy V Advan- Oh shit! Okay, buy a copy of Final Fantasy V Pixel Remaster and then emulate a copy of Final Fantasy V Advance. That way isn't this ethically murky. Let's get into the story though before I head into my experiences with the gameplay. And I can say off the bat that just as Final Fantasy III had a job system and a simpler plot compared to its predecessor, Final Fantasy V kinda did that again. It goes back to the job system, and at least compared to Final Fantasy IV, it also has a simpler plot. It's weird. Much like in previous games, there exists four crystals on the planet that keeps things in balance. The wind crystal keeps the tides and winds flowing, the water crystal keeps the water from stagnating, the earth crystal enriches the land's soil, and the fire crystal keeps these random patches of fire and Karnak burning. Is this... Normal for this town? The King of Tycoon senses that something is amiss in the Wind Shrine where the Wind Crystal is kept, as the Wind itself is becoming weaker by the day. Upon visiting the Shrine, the King stands witness to the Wind Crystal shattering into bite-sized pieces. Elsewhere, a young adventurer named Bartz, who fun fact in Japanese is known as Butts, and you're fucking right, that's what I named him for my playthrough because Butts will never not be funny and I'm internally 9 years old. Bartz is chilling out by campfire with this trusty chocobo companion named Boko, when a sudden meteorite crash lands near the Tycoon Kingdom, and thank goodness this meteorite has the density of a fucking balloon house apparently because this thing crashed and should have been the end of the Tycoon Kingdom. I've seen Deep Impact and Armageddon growing up, they should all be dead. Bartz checks the landing site where he then rescues a girl from a goblin attack. Introducing herself as Lena, the girl is in fact the daughter of King Tycoon and wishes to travel to the Wind Shrine to get info on her father who has since gone missing. Also nearby is the rugged Gallif, a dude found unconscious near the meteorite that is currently suffering from amnesia but knows that he too was also headed for the Wind Shrine. So together the team makes way for it, crossing a pirate hideout during the journey. Seeing the pirate ship managing to sail with no wind has the group intrigued, so to make the journey faster, they plan to commandeer the vessel but they're quickly apprehended by the pirates and their leader Ferris. Lena tries to use her status as princess to convince Ferris to let them use the ship, but it isn't until Ferris notices Lena's pendant looking remarkably similar like her own that she decides to aid their cause. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, Ferris is a woman. I know I just blatantly said that with no buildup, but it doesn't take long for that to be revealed anyway. And given the goofy nature of the game's vibe, they aren't very subtle with that twist. It's actually kind of creepy looking back. They stop by a village on the way to the shrine and Ferris sleeps in her own room, right? And the gang wonders what's taking her so long, so Bartz barges into her room while sleeping and notices that, man, this guy's looking pretty hot. Bartz probably wondering, dude, am I gay? Bye, at least. But then later, when the gang is marooned in the ship graveyard, they have to take a swim to get past some debris, and while Ferris is initially hesitant on the idea, she goes through with it. And then afterwards, when the gang decide to dry their clothes near a bonfire, Bartz and Gallo try to make Ferris forcibly strip in what I'm sure was supposed to come off as a playful moment, at least as far as playful moments in the early to mid 90s go, but it just makes Bartz and Gallo come off as creeps. Like, boy or girl, you don't get up in someone's personal space like that. But that's where Ferris's true gender is revealed, and that's that. Nothing really changes afterwards. It's just a fun little tidbit. And that is a good way of describing most of Final Fantasy V's plot. Like, forget all the melodrama and misfortune of Final Fantasy IV, this plot is almost a damn parody of itself. But I mean that more in tone, because our protagonists are still put through the ringer. Well, Cryo is put through the ringer, but still, Final Fantasy V is way more lighthearted than, I want to say, every other game previously. It gets goofy in dialogue, the updated localization especially, is not afraid of basking in puns and snippy remarks, and starting with this game, character sprites are more expressive. Before, it was stoic face frowny face. But now characters laugh, they look surprised, they look dumbfounded. It's a big step up from Final Fantasy IV, and it's used damned effectively to sell the emotional state of the scene. But the story is a damn simple one. After being bestowed new powers thanks to the shards of the Wind Crystal, the gang make it their mission to travel the rest of the world and prevent the other three crystals from shattering and dooming the planet, visiting different kingdoms and other landscapes while making some new friends along the way, like the engineer Sid and his son Mid. Wow, Sid's a jerk! But every time the gang make it to a crystal, it ends up shattering right before their very eyes. Unlike Final Fantasy IV, however, where it just seemed like fate hated Cecil's guts, this is secretly the work of an ancient evil that yearns to be released from its prison. That creature is an ancient sorcerer named X-Death. Yeah, X-Death. I'm telling you, man, this game, like Mystic Quest, isn't afraid to take the piss out of things. After remembering that he isn't from this world, Galif explains that years ago, X-Death was sealed using the power of the crystals thanks to Galif and his buddies known as the Dawn Warriors, one of which being Bartz's father, again a nice little tidbit but nothing that impactful to Bartz's overall journey I think. But over the course of time, the power of the crystals weakened, allowing X-Death to slowly start manipulating things behind the scenes, using the King of Tycoon to make his eventual escape and put his ultimate plan into motion, for X-Death wishes to control the Void, where all life began but where X-Death wants all things to end. To prevent X-Death from escaping, 
Galif traveled by meteor to Bart's world, which when I say out loud sounds metal as fuck, maybe Sora in Dream Drop Distance was onto something. But because we're only 7 to 8 hours in this journey, the final crystal ends up shattering and X-Death is released from his prison like a cackling Rita Repulsa. And I know when folks think of X-Death, they think of that wonderfully hammy performance from Dissidia thanks to Gerald C. Rivers and his lust for all things void. But he's a little more vanilla, a little more rudimentary, not nearly as layered as Goldez, but still a cackling, devious, traditional RPG villain that is one step ahead of the heroes in almost every turn that also has a hate boner for turtles. They have a Dragon Ball fight later, and it's fucking ridiculous. With X-Death on the loose, he travels back to Gallus' world to set his plan into motion, with Gallif and eventually the whole crew giving chase. The assault on X-Death's home base pits our heroes against a horde of otherworldly demons and entities, including the eccentric Gilgamesh, repeatedly giving the heroes trouble throughout their adventure through the second world. Gilgamesh is the highlight of the game easily, a borderline pathetic goofball that can throw hands when the chips are down, but always seems down on his luck. I think he's the perfect embodiment of Final Fantasy V's tone and presentation. It's no wonder he became a Final Fantasy mainstay, or at least starting with Final Fantasy VIII and beyond because uh, he isn't a thing in the next two games. The squad later meet with Guido, the magical talking turtle, that sends our heroes to the Guardian Tree where they can protect this planet's set of crystals and prevent X-Death from using them for his own agenda. They also learn that X-Death is an evil tree. Okay, it's more like he's the embodiment of a bunch of evil spirits contained within a tree, but he's a tree. Make of that what you will. Alas, X-Death manipulates the heroes into breaking the protective seal of the crystals and capitalizes on the moment soon after, bodying our heroes like no tomorrow, then stealing the crystals for himself. Gallop's granddaughter Kryl attempts to intervene to save her grandpa, but is no match for the evil wood and is almost killed until Gallop manages to break free of his confinement and using his last ounce of strength, saves Kryl from X-Death's wrath, but getting himself killed in the process. Similar to Tella's fate in the last game, only Gallif was the fun grandpa while Tella definitely reeked of the racist grandpa. X-Death makes a retreat taking the crystals with him while Kral grieves the loss of her grandpa, but with her being bestowed all of her grandpa's skills and job mastery, she becomes the new fourth party member for the gang. And you know, I was gonna make the Charlie's Angel joke for the sixth review, but I kinda forgot Final Fantasy V did that already with the final party composition, one male, three females. That's Charlie's Angels, fuckers took my joke and I was none the wiser. Wanting to take advantage of X-Death's weakened state, the gang heads straight for X-Death's castle and take the fight directly to him. And after an arduous battle, the gang managed to win, but the crystals of the second world immediately shatter afterwards and our heroes awaken to find Bart's world and Gallus' world merged into one, all according to X-Death's plan, as he needed the world to be in its original state in order to unlock the power of the void, something he immediately puts to use, giving some towns and other establishments the nasty SUCK! Slowly but surely, X-Death is consuming the planet and sending things to oblivion, prompting our heroes to get off their asses and find a way to stop X-Death once and for all. Luckily, the world's merging also unlocked the way to release the seals and the 12 legendary weapons that were used eons ago to stop this sort of thing from happening. Yeah, so it's said that the reasons the world was split into two was because it was the only way to prevent the power of the void from being used. And before, it wasn't X-Death, but this wizard named Enuo who sacrificed his immortality to gain control of the void. Essentially, he's like the progenitor of this whole fiasco, so it makes you think this dude's gonna be like the head honcho at the end of all this, but he's just a plot device that's soon forgotten as quickly as he's mentioned. And it wasn't until the advanced release where he became an optional super boss in the game's optional dungeon. Yeah, it's likely, well, he was defeated with the legendary weapons a long time ago. He's dead, that's the end of his story. But yeah, I was kind of expecting a little more from this dude. Am I alone in that? Well, it's at this point of the story where you're free to do what you want to prepare for the final onslaught against X-Death. You don't have to unlock the legendary weapons, but you're heavily encouraged to do so because final area has a shit ton of boss fights. Whatever you decide to do, the gang will sooner or later make their way through the interdimensional rift where X-Death resides and confront him one last time. Dude, I'm fighting a tree. Also, the Gamma Correction mod missed a tile there. That happened twice, both involving trees thinking back. Maybe the modder has a thing against Mother Nature or X-Death. It's a nail-biting encounter with X-Death becoming consumed by the very void he yearned to control. But from that emerges Neo X-Death, who wishes to return everything to nothingness, including himself. And that is just, all right, this dude just went from nine to 15 on the, oh, this motherfucker's got a go meter. And with their combined might and some loose change, Neo X-Death is defeated, the world is saved, and all the towns and other areas consumed by the void are returned to the planet proper. The ending sort of changes depending on who lives through the last fight. If anyone is KO'd when Neo X-Death dies, they won't have the strength to make it back home, and it's implied that they die in the void. You find out later that isn't the case, thanks to Gallop and his other dead companions, they eventually find their way back home. But when I beat the game the first time for this video, only Ferris was left standing, and I felt so bad because she looked so alone venturing through the world, wondering if her friends are alright, hoping to see them again one day. I loaded up the previous save file and defeated Neo X then again and made sure everyone was alive this time because damn, that was kind of depressing, even though again, they're all okay by the end. But it still hit me in the gut. Nevertheless, everyone's reunited and it feels so good. Our heroes venture off for a new adventure ending the game 
which is later followed up by an OVA called The Legend of the Crystals released in the mid 90s that I actually rented once from a Hollywood video in my youth. I won't go into it now, but it's got great animation, it's got a good soundtrack. The English dub is also surprisingly solid for the time it was released. And it has moments like this girl absorbing the wind crystal, her ass glowing throughout the rest of the animation because of it, and then she later shoots a beam from out of her asshole. But you see what I mean by straightforward? They reeled it back rather significantly from Final Fantasy IV. In fact, I know one criticism Final Fantasy V often gets is that its narrative feels flat, the characters even more so, at least compared to the previous entry, and I do agree to some extent, but there is beauty in its simplicity. I think it's clear the developers never intended Final Fantasy V to be another Final Fantasy IV or the next logical step forward. No, they wanted Final Fantasy V to be a cheesy, lighthearted romp that's plot is as thin as wax paper, but makes up for it with its quirky tidbits. Maybe because they were saving their strength for Final Fantasy VI and they wanted to take it easy for one game. Who can say, but I still think this game is just fine. Bartz is the straight man to everyone else's shenanigans, but he's no stranger to getting thrown in the wacky scenarios when he needs to, and he doesn't really put himself on a pedestal and I like that about him. Galif is a fun, lovable grandpa that isn't afraid to get his hands dirty and loves fucking around with Bartz. Lena might be the standard RPG princess, but she's just as adventurous as the rest and is a little too eager to get poisoned multiple times for the sake of helping out. You can tell me in her later years she'd have grown a natural immunity to all poisons and I'd buy that in a fucking heartbeat. Ferris, as leader of the pirates who don't do shit, has a tough exterior that quickly crumbles when she loses her best friend Soldier early in the game, a magical sea dragon that steered her ship and guided the crew to safety when needed. Soldier's awesome too, you get her as a summon later and she fucks everything up, but man I hate it when she dies because her cry cuts directly into my soul. Oh fuck, I hate that sound. Cryo gets all the emotional trauma, but she's a super sweet and adorable badass that can ride dragons, smack a grown man like a bitch, and she can speak to animals. Although missed opportunity to tie into Final Fantasy 2, they should have had her speak beaver. But I think even the devs thought, yeah, that was a fucking weird footnote from last time, wasn't it? But no, the animals I'm referring to here are Moogles, who technically made their debut in Final Fantasy 3, but they were glorified background characters in that game. Here they have a little more significance helping the players in the Guardian Tree area when it catches fire, so I always look at Final Fantasy 5 as their proper debut, and they even get their signature lay motif in this adventure. I agree that the characters could have used a little more dimension, because the most we get out of some of these characters are fun facts. Like Bart's, in a bit moment, it's established that he has a fear of heights. This is later followed up in a flashback when he visits his hometown, Licks. Yeah, his hometown is called Licks, and considering his Japanese his name is Butts. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Lix's own Butts. But anyway, a flashback shows one day during a game of hide and seek, Bart's got a little too dedicated to the craft and hit on the rooftop of a house for which he spent all day stranded because he was never found. And for sure, I laughed, that poor little fuck. But that's never played into any character growth or plot significance again. It's just a fun fact. Ferris being revealed as the long lost sister of Lena? A fun fact, doesn't really matter in the grand scheme, I'd argue. I suppose it gives Lena a source of comfort when King Tycoon later passes away. Lena at least has that luxury. Because oh my god, poor Kryle. She gets the worst of it, and she's just a kid. Her grandfather heads off to danger unknown. She later watches her grandfather die right before her eyes, and unlike Lena, Kryle has no one else. She's all alone, and it's something she has to deal with for a bit. You just want to give her a big old hug, but uh... Gallus Lethal Arsenal will do for now. With the exception of Cryo, I'd argue, the heroes of Final Fantasy V don't really grow, they pretty much remain the way they are for the whole journey. So like in Final Fantasy III, it's more about the little things the characters get into, the moments that define the journey. That's sort of the whole theme of Final Fantasy V, kicking back and enjoying the adventure. It's not really about the destination, I think. Watch a girl perform a little dance for you, and then grow concerned when the girl doesn't stop spinning in place after. How the game has fun with that later on when Bartz is asked to do a dance on stage, and it's as pathetic as it sounds, but the bar keeps stepping out of the counter to give him some stripper guilt is just the icing on the cake. Witness says Bart slowly becomes better at playing the piano as you find more of them through the adventure. When you're thrown for a loop when trying to find this secret switch in the ancient ruins, following the instructions left by someone who ends up being a total asshole and sends you in a circle. That is a legitimately great moment, one of my favorites in the game. Final Fantasy V is full of this and more and I think it makes up for the lack of character growth. This game knows what it wants to be and flourishes for it. But that's not even the thing that makes the game. No, I, I rarely hear people talk about the level of Final Fantasy V being centered on the story. It's the gameplay, because they brought the job system back from Final Fantasy III, but now it's not as limited or antiquated. It can finally spread its wings, and it's not only the defining aspect of the game, it's also the best thing about it. Characters are once again granted new jobs whenever they reach the next crystal, and just like that, you're free to switch between any job you want with no job currency to spend, no job sickness to worry about like the DS version of Final Fantasy III. You want to be a berserker now, Ferris? You fucking go for it. Go Unga. Nothing's stopping you but your imagination, and maybe some money because you do have to outfit your job with appropriate gear. But that's easily handled with the game's many shops, and it'll only take a few battles to earn some money, and there are plenty of primo spots to farm cash. And for magic users, you only have to buy the corresponding spell once, and every character will have access to it as long as they're using the proper job. And that's just plain nifty, man. That's what I like to see, trimming the fat in areas that matter. 
Regarding combat, Final Fantasy V continues using the active time battle system introduced in Final Fantasy IV, and that hasn't seen much change. It's fundamentally very similar to IV, so battles are snappy and can be even faster if you set the configuration to active instead of wait. I don't think Final Fantasy V wanted to do much fixing on something that wasn't very broken in the first place, though. No. It's all about what you can get from that with the job system, the fun and replayability you can get mixing and matching different skill sets you can acquire by leveling up jobs. Characters still have standard growth with experience points and all that, but you also get ability points for your jobs, and after a bit it levels up and gives the character a permanent ability that they can then use as an extra ability for when they want to level up a different job. Level up a time mage for a little bit so that later, you can be a ninja that can not only throw dangerous elemental scrolls, but also buff the party with time magic or slow the enemy down. Become a white mage that can also summon lethal deities to wipe the floor with enemies, and yes that was in reference to Yuna, Final Fantasy X should be a fun video, but that's way later. Bottom line, there is so much you can do with this system, no limit on the various combinations you can experiment with so that in the end, you're outfitting your base class with all the goodies. Everyone starts as a freelancer. They can equip any piece of gear and weapons, but they have no inherent skills. And there is a YouTuber joke I can make with that somewhere, I fucking know it. With a little patience though, they easily become the best class because a great thing about Final Fantasy V is that leveling up jobs not only gets you new abilities for you to equip as you see fit, but when you master a specific job, you not only get all their abilities unlocked, but their innate abilities are permanently added to the freelancer role. A freelancer with a mastered ninja can just naturally use two weapons without needing to equip the dual-handed skill. A freelancer with a mastered black mage has more magic power and MP than usual. Combine all this with additional abilities you can equip at your leisure and <laughs> Final Fantasy V is so fun to break. And for this video, I admit I did do like the basic bitch cheese. I leveled up my Mystic Knights to get those enhanced spell blades. I leveled up the Ranger class to get rapid fire, allowing my character to strike four times in one turn. If you have dual wield on top of that, that is eight fucking times your characters get to attack in one turn. Admittedly, getting the most fun out of Final Fantasy V does require a bit of hindsight because there are a few jobs that may seem like a bunch of nothing, but can be amazing in their own ways if you just knew what to do. You know, that's the kind of thing about this system. Sometimes it's not always obvious what makes your job tick, and you don't know if you should bother wasting your time. And just getting this out there now, no, I did not play as every job because I'd be tripling my playtime and I don't have all day, and I was already finding myself getting caught up in leveling alternate jobs when I really didn't need to because I am awful at keeping things on schedule. My party composition at the end was filled with magical spells galore, a bunch of spell blades, a lot of dual wielding happy slaps, and oh man, the chemist. I got a lot of mileage with that class to go around. There are some bosses you can instantly nuke with a proper mix. Again, that does require hindsight, but it doesn't make it any less fun when you know how it works. And with Final Fantasy V, that is something you'll need to get a grasp on. The game's difficulty can easily sneak up on you if you're not careful. With such a robust job system, yeah, the game knows what it gives you and puts you to work. Not only can common fodder give you shit, and with some it's pretty obvious, like, you don't fuck with a scroll named the Skull Eater, okay? But even enemies like Steel Fist later on can just- Jesus, fuck, I'm bad at this. Boss fights are thrown at you at what feels like every other corner you turn. There are so many in this game, both mandatory and optional. This game loves its optional boss fights. From wandering summons you can later add to your collection, all the encounters you face to unlock more legendary weapons, and Final Fantasy V is the first to give us the optional super boss. Sure, Final Fantasy I had the war mech, but that was more an unfortunate random encounter, not really a proper boss by JRPG definition. Here though, uh-uh, you're warned about them properly, and you can fight them whenever, Omega and Shinryu. And you know, Shinryu is not that big of a deal with a proper setup, he's pretty easy to break. But fuck Omega, he's so fast, I can barely get an attack before he nukes me with wave cannons, rocket punches, erasing characters from existence. I know it too can be handled with better equipment and strategies, but man, fuck this guy hard. Cry was the only one left alive when I managed to win the battle, making her grandfather proud with her resolve. I'm sure she'll be fine. But I bother with these guys at all because, man, you feel so powerful with the job skills and combinations you can make for them. I love the adventurous feeling this game evokes, putting your skills to the test and seeing things work out. Back when I first played this game so many years ago on the PlayStation, you know, this was something I didn't really appreciate. With so many jobs at my disposal, I didn't know where I could take things, so I just picked the job I liked the most and tried to play the game with that and nothing but. Sort of like the first Final Fantasy. In a way, I was sort of doing the four job fiesta challenge without even realizing it. That's something dedicated Final Fantasy V players love doing where they're given four jobs at random and they have to play the game with nothing but those jobs, challenging the player on their knowledge of battle mechanics and how to get the most out of their current job. Again, that's meant to be a challenge run, and I was playing that way for my first playthrough, and it gave me the completely wrong idea on the game. And by the time I got to the crystal fight and the guardian tree, I gave up and put the game down. That boss gave me so much shit as a kid. A few years later, when I got the game for the Game Boy Advance, I was considerably more experimental, and I was able to appreciate the mechanics on a deeper level. This is a great Final Fantasy, a great JRPG in general, that I 
don't think makes for a good starting point because I feel the job system might be a little too overwhelming for newcomers. There's a lot you can do with that, but this game does not hold your hand. It leaves a lot up to the player to decide how they're going to approach things, and that sense of freedom can be intoxicating, but again, overwhelming. But I love that about Final Fantasy V. Shit, when you reach the third act and you're free to explore things at your leisure, whether it's on the ground or on a chocobo, on a speedy airship that's also a boat that's also a submarine, with nothing but your sense of curiosity stopping you from exploring the unknown and discovering new things to help make things easier for the final battle, I am in heaven. I love that. It is a little intimidating at times, but when it all comes together and you overcome that obstacle, that is simply the best. The dungeons aren't the best. Some are a little too winding. Some are a little too happy-go-lucky with switch pushing, with branching pathways that can make it a bit cumbersome to fully explore, and with the encounter rate being higher than usual. That just exacerbates things. I didn't find myself running away from battles just to get a move on, if that means anything. It's just, even with the map feature of the pixel remaster, there are areas here that are like, wait, where the fuck was I going again? Right, I'm spending too much time in this fiery castle trying to get all the treasure because the time limit is super generous, and I want this dude's blue mage skill. Shit. Oh yeah, this was the first game to do that, wasn't it? Putting a countdown on certain events to lay on the pressure? Well, that's not that big of a deal here, shit, especially if you got a thief in your party with the Pixel Remaster's inherent dash feature, you might as well be on three different kinds of drugs you go so fast. The story might be a little thin, the adventure's a little been there, done that, but as a game, Final Fantasy V excels in what it sets out to do and is all the better for it. And it helps that the game still looks great, Pixel Remaster or Super Nintendo, it doesn't matter. The graphics are a good hybrid between the 8-bit style of the NES games and the style they would eventually settle on with Final Fantasy VI, in a way giving you a good dose of both worlds without really outshining either. The Red Mage of Super Nintendo graphics. Fun fact, this was the first game where the monster designer was Tetsuya Nomura. Yes, Kingdom Hearts, Tetsuya Nomura. If you remember my first video of that series, I stated I always loved them as a monster designer, and it starts as early as here. There are some truly wonderful monster designs here that are as beautiful as they are threatening. We haven't gotten to some of his best work yet, but for his first job here, a damn good first impression. I don't enjoy the soundtrack as much as I do Final Fantasy IV or VI, but it's still a great listen, once again composed entirely by Nobuo Yamatsu. But dude, the Pixel Remaster fucked up the Chocobo grunt. It's supposed to sound like this. But now it's like... This is the game that gave us Battle on the Big Bridge, forever associated with Gilgamesh. Oh, I love the cavern theme of this game, the original especially. The pixel remaster arrangement is great, but doesn't quite hit the same mood. The same can be said with X-Death's battle theme. That percussion in the original just gets me. I don't want to repeat too many of the same beats of my Final Fantasy IV video, at least not this time. But yeah, the soundtrack's great, I love listening to it, and I hope you do too. It doesn't really matter what version you end up playing, the Super Nintendo original, Game Boy Advance, the Pixel Remaster, I'd say just avoid the anthology version on the PlayStation. The localization isn't the best, the music isn't up to snuff, and to ah! But at its core, Final Fantasy V is a better, much better Final Fantasy III. Taking the promising job system of that game and demonstrating what you could really do with it with none of that Crystal Tower bullshit, yes? My ass is still sore about that. But next time, I'm going to be talking Final Fantasy VI. To us Americans, we knew it as Final Fantasy III for a time. Whatever you want to call it. Uh, I call it... Well, you'll see. <laughs> as always, thank you all for watching. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask. If you decide to go outside, get vaccinated if possible. Have yourselves a fantastic night. And take care.